I'm not sure about the word success, but uh, let me take you through um, what you term as success. For me, it's, it's not success. I went into the mining sector to challenge the stereotypes in terms of mining being white African and male. And uh, I found myself with the first project that we started in 1999 called ASCO, which in 2006 merged with Kumba to form what is today called Exaro. I was a founder member. I started with Siponkosi, but I didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, remember, there were six of us. Uh, I was the first woman, and I brought the second woman simply because I realized that if I was not going to fight for more women to participate in the structure, uh, I was going to have men and me alone. And I went to Sipo and I said, Sipo, I'm very uncomfortable to be in your structure without other women and Typical of men, Sipo said, yeah, give me a chartered accountant who's female tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I didn't sleep that night. Mm. I searched for a woman, whether I knew that woman or not, but I found someone who was working for ESCOM Consulting. Her name was Kodu Musweni, chartered accountant. And when I met her, I realized that Kodu was someone who we were part of a consortium called Women in Oil and Gas. And I think it was a group of about 30 women. And me and a friend of mine called Tandi Mara were kicked out of the consortium because we were seen as talking too much. And she was the woman who actually, out of the 28 others, came and said, I will tell them. She called me and she said, do you have a fax number? I said, yes. And she said, go to the fax. And I got to the fax. I thought they were saying, hey, we've got this deal, you know, that we've been working mm. f for so long for. And I get, you know, on the email, I read it from the, <laughs> I remember very well, from the fax machine that says, you are fired from the consortium. Oh. But when I met Hodu, I realized that because she had the guts to actually confront me, and tell me that I'm fired. Mm. So many others couldn't do it. And I realized that she's a very strong woman. And I brought her into ASC Zwe. And unfortunately, she passed away in 2007. But she remains a shareholder. Her estate remains a shareholder in what is today called Exaro that we started. So for me, Kalakadi Manganiz was a protest project from graduating from the ASC Zwe stable where we were a minority a tiny portion because people wanted to comply. I didn't want that. I wanted, you know, a company where women can take decisions because when women take decisions, we are able to look at the social impact of what we are doing on a daily basis. Mm. When we wake up in the morning, we want to know that our children have food on the table. They have uniforms. They go to school and so on. So even at work, you translate that automatically by looking at the well-being of your employees. If they are female, if they are pregnant, are they looking after their, their kids and, and so on and so forth. But also when you look at communities, it's the same thing. So for me, I went into mining because I wanted to transform. I was tired of women being invited for toilet paper and catering contracts or opportunities. I wanted to go to the backbone of the economy. And South Africa's economy is really based on mining. And I realized that let me go where it hurts the men to challenge them where they are the strongest mm -hmm. and see if I succeed, probably uh, I will succeed for the doomies of this world mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And for me, I knew it was not going to be easy. Changing uh, mindsets is not an event. It's a process. It takes long. It has all sorts of challenges. So it was very difficult. It was more difficult given the fact that mining is white, African, and male. Mm -hmm. Number one, people don't believe in you. Number two, they were brought up in any case not to believe in you because you are black, you are a woman, so you don't know anything. You are not a first-class citizen. You are a second-class citizen. So all those issues come into being. You see even some of the people that you either contract or you employ, when they talk to you, you realize that they still have not moved and you have to shake them. Hence the label Iron Lady and so on and so forth. Because when I realize that somebody is showing me that I actually don't matter, I stop and address that issue.
it's not only in South Africa. It's that between 13 and 15 percent, both in South Africa and international. It therefore calls on those of us who are influential, number one, to actually change the industry, change the private sector, encourage the private sector, because it's very difficult. It's people who start their own businesses and they take decisions whether they want women on their boards or not. Mm. But unfortunately, uh, even in South Africa, where we have legislation in terms of the participation of women, women would want to participate in, in everything that we do in South Africa. But the, the biggest barrier to entry, of course, is funding. Huh. Unfortunately, funding white Africaner and male credit committees. And if they were to evaluate a project, to me, it's, it's about perception, risk. You have to believe in someone for you to believe that they, they are capable because it's not written anywhere. You cannot touch risk. Mm. Risk is perception. And once it's perception, it's when they sit there and look at a proposal that has been written by a black woman who does not have technical background. I'm not a mining engineer mm. who has never done it before to say, no, we put our money here and it's going to sink. But if it was another man, they go to bars on Fridays, they socialize together, they go to the golf, you know, uh, course together, they have, they interact with each other. So they know each other. It becomes easier uh. because the perception is removed by interaction. But if they actually don't know you, you're really far removed and therefore you will never get, you know, to get the money, the finance. Uh. But also, you know, there's a perception out there when you look at the number of women that bank with the same banks. Because when you ask them, why am I not getting money? They'll tell you, no, but you, know, you must understand we're taking somebody's money and giving it, you know, to you. They forget that when they say somebody's money, they're talking about 52% of everybody in South Africa is female. And therefore, the banks, 52% of, of people who bank with all the banks, by the way, it's female as well. It's not money that you put in the bank by males only. So it's all those things that are very, very, very quiet. You know, you never see them, but they're there. They block the participation of women. Yeah. It's not because women are not capable. Women don't want to go into these in industries. There are so many barriers to entry. And when you raise these issues, people come with quotas. People come with offsets. Yes, offsets are necessary. But if, for instance, some of the financial development funding institutions will put you know, an offset of 600 million for women in South Africa, it therefore means if Dumi comes with a project that is worth 2 billion, what happens to the millions of other women that are looking for the same amount of cash uh -huh. or less uh -huh. for that matter? So yes, the set-asides are necessary as for Greenfields projects that are smaller, but we are saying we want to compete because we are capable. Mm. We are not in business because we are female. We are in business because we are capable of doing what we are doing. Would you say, Ma, those are the reasons that drive you towards building legacies that correlate and run concurrently with your businesses? Yes. For me, I want to challenge the stereotypes, patriarchal stereotypes that determine that women belong to the kitchen. We need to deal with that because we actually belong everywhere. Even in the kitchen, even at home, even at work, we still manage. We are good managers. We are multitasks. We multitask. We bring for the men to succeed. They succeed because we are there. And I like the saying that says behind every successful man, there's a woman. And I'm not saying behind every successful uh, man, there's a woman on the sides, in front mm -hmm. and everywhere else. Women are always there as mothers, as wives, as children. You know, so even as PAs, yes, people might look down upon those, but they actually run their lives. It is because I've seen how my mother, standard three, pretty lady, colored lady, 
got married to my father, uh, did everything, and never recognized for anything that she did. Mm. Trashed all the time, abused all the time, ended up with four children on her own, bringing them up. And I said, there's something wrong in the model where my father would come after a few years, a few months, uh, and say, why did you plant this you know, flower here and not there when she was, he was not there for 12 months? And, and for my mother to come to Joburg, it's because my grandfather, my father's father, gave her money to say, you've got four children in my house. Your husband has not been home for three years. Here's money. Go and look for him in Johannesburg where he's working. And my mother came here to look for a, a long-lost husband, dumped her with four children. So for me, it's all those things because I saw the pain, I saw the suffering, I saw the hope and the determination working in the textile industry uh, So as a seamstress. The money that she was earning at the time, it was one pound six. And at the time, the value of the rand to a pound was two rand. Mm -hmm. So... Literally, she was earning two and sixteen cents. But with the two and sixteen cents, we would eat, we would clothe us, we would pay medical care. You know, we will have almost everything. We'll eat like everyone else. Yes. yes, we didn't have the nice things that other children have, but we never, you know, slept without food in our stomachs. Mm -hmm. So she worked hard, and I realized that that we are what we are today because of her. And therefore, I also became a mother myself. I also became a female activist that fought for the rights of women. I challenged customary law and the minority status of African women that said, as a woman, you do not have a status of your own. You only have that status of your husband. It's still so true even today because when you sign that CIPRO form as a director, you need your husband's signature. So I challenged those. I presented in 1994 to the then Minister of Justice, uh, Dalla Omar, to say we need to change legislation because I cannot, as a rural woman, bring up children. You know, you, the, the husband will leave you with two heads of, of cattle, go for five years and go and stay with Dumi in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. You, you know, the, 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 the crawl gets full by you looking after the cattle, the two that was left, you have 20. You can't even sell to take your children to school. Mm -hmm. You have to wait for this man who we don't know when he's going to come back. I realized that there was a problem. So I always fought the, for the rights of women, but I didn't stop there. I started income generating projects, training for rural women. In 1985, I was the national coordinator of the national movement of rural women. 1992, when the, nation, the Women's Development Bank was started with Mrs. Mbegi, microfinance, so that women can start income-generating projects, but didn't have funding. Mm. At the time, the first loan was 30 rand to go buy bananas so that you can go to the market either in Bushburg Ridge, because that's where we started in Castilli, uh, so that women can start income-generating projects. Our first loan was 30 rand, 300 rand. You know, uh, the interest is 30 rand over three months, you know, but women survived yeah. and women grew. We have those that ended up growing bigger because we started them there. So for me, I realized that you empower women, you empower communities. Yeah. Because as the saying goes, uh, our brothers from Africa, you know, I was told by a good friend of mine when I was at the CEO's forum in Geneva, and he said, you see where I come from, my sister in, in Nigeria, when you are as strong as you are, mm. Tiffany, they'll say, you see, I will leave you in the village mm. and take a mistress to London for shopping. Mm. So it's not only in South Africa. It happens everywhere. So as women... We need to ensure that in our little spaces, we work very hard to bring in more women for the betterment of society. You might look at yourself to me, uh, money web, in your own space. You need to ensure that there's m many more to me mm. coming through.
so that they can change society because that's what you do. We are experts in that. We are good at that. But also, we are focused. If we believe in something, we are going to do it for the betterment of society.